are watching a Fact TV presentation of the town of Swansea. I'll call the March 20th meeting to order. Recording in progress. Organization. Yeah, just motions. This year we're going to be running the, uh, myself as chair, Bill will be vice chair, and Jimmy will be uh, secretary of the board. Our representatives to the planning board will be, mine's ending this month. Uh, Jimmy's going to start April? No. No. Bill? Sorry. Too soon. April, May, June, July. You've got <laughs> August, <laughs> September. We're going to uh, October, okay. October. Yeah. Then on uh, December, March again. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Capital Improvement Committee will be going again. Yeah. And I'll be on the Economic Development and Advisory Committee. Consideration of meeting minutes. I'll make a motion for the March 12th special meeting. Second. Any errors or corrections necessary? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 And I abstain. So I wasn't there. You were there. Just and official. I, I wasn't official, right? So I'll make a motion on the regular meeting on March 6th. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 I'll abstain. Non-public, I'll make a motion, non-public meeting of March 6th. Second. All in favor say aye. Abstain. Aye. Aye. Okay. Consent agenda. I'll make a motion that we accept the consent agenda. Second. Anything further, Michael? If not... All in favor say aye. 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 Garrett, my uh, microphone keeps going off. That's the battery problem, so <laughs> you want to just switch okay. Thank you. Wireless. Public input. Anything for the good of the order? Oh, great. Hopefully we're on Zoom. <laughs> Appointments, we got Conservation Commission Chair Sherry Domina, the Schwillet River Park Stabilization Project. We have the guest chair for you right there. project is if you wanted to take a minute and look at that we could um, and then the last bullet point is basically what she's asking for from the town so I'll just give you a minute to look at that and if you have any questions let me know and on the reverse is a, a diagram so uh, from their the engineer la the last time you were here and brought this up i don't know if maybe we were under the assumption that you were looking to replant some trees but it looks like you're going to create some log jams man-made log jams that are yeah protect the bank right so the connecticut river conservancy is heading up the whole project they'll be hiring somebody to come in and um they'll be they're looking for trees which is part of their request is that maybe the town can help come up with some trees during another project um, and they're going to sort of jam those trees with the root balls into the banks 
um, and create sort of a terraced bank as well uh, along the, the um, campground as well as we're looking, the reason we're here is we're looking to do it on the town property too at mm -hmm. the muster field. Um, so it'll create more of a terrace situation, allow the river to rise and spread out a little bit, but also um, hold the soil in place um, with the, the root balls and also they'll be planting vegetation on those terraces too and, and hopefully that'll have some time to take root. So. Does it not have to be the material brought in with soil because you have the right soil for these plants to grow? It looks like it's all sandy bank. Right. The problem right now is it's just a sheer sandy bank and every, right. time, the, every time there's a, a storm and the river rises it just washes out more sand. So the idea is they're going to create a whole new bank system, um, and some of this will be um, soil like inside of. Um, I know I'm not going to describe it exactly because I'm not an engineer, but they'll have it sort of encapsulated in fabric, um, so it's not going to just get washed away. And there'll yeah, be plantings so on it. Time period before the cells in. Right. So we have a flood early. Right. It's gonna take us out. Well, I, I think it's designed to withstand that. So there'll be some fabric, some soil inside the fabric, and then there'll be stuff that's planted in amongst it, as well as um, to hold it in until the stuff takes hold will be these root balls. And they've already collected a whole bunch of stumps over there that you've probably seen piled on the campground property if you've been over there. Um, they'll be using some of those too in amongst what's there just so that it doesn't all get wiped away by the next flood. The root balls are going to be attached to 20 to 30 feet worth of tree. Yeah. So it's not just stumps like they were into before. They're looking for 30 feet of tree with the roots. So it would be it would be you know, almost like a normal retention wall. How you would you, know, you would put your timber down and you would put something going to the bank. Timber yeah. down, something going to the bank. So that's what they're trying to do. That makes that 30 feet of tree go into the bank. And what yeah. the gentleman said, which was kind of an interesting, was if it works right, it'll look. Natural look accidental. It won't look like it's been engineered. It won't be neat. It won't be pretty. It's supposed to be a mess. It's, they're trying to recreate a lot of jam. Yeah, and there will be rocks in there holding those things in place too. So we're hoping we find trees in Swansea that we can transplant to that particular place. Uh, not so much transplant as um, so we can. They can be stored on the um, campground property. Uh, until such time as they're going to do the project. But um, yeah, so if, if something's getting cut down, instead of being cut down, it just needs to be pushed over with a bulldozer so you got a roof ball attached and then somehow hauled over and stored it for a while. So should we uh, refer this to Joe and let him coordinate with the property next to the BPW that's probably clear? Well, I think, so I think that's. Partly where it started was discussing it with them. I just they're looking at three to five years down the road, and I just think the timing might might not align. I think they are planning. Yeah, it, and hardwoods are going to be best, ideal. I mean, if all we get is pines, that's all we get. But I think hardwoods are going to be best because they're going to hold up a lot longer than some structural pine trees. I think that's just me a little bit of his time on that lot. Yeah. Yep. Oh, so you're looking at three to five years down the road. You don't want us to start storing anything now. If something happens now, it's a and it's a it's a tree or something. It'll probably store fine. Um, I think right now, what especially they're looking for is just a permission to do this on the town property from the town. Um, B, they're they're looking for some letters of support. So I know our lot will be given the letters of support. They want that from the conservation commission. Um, and then, you know, they're not asking us for money, but if we find some money, they'll take it, or if we know about grants that come up that they might be able to pursue, um, and then the, the trees. Any restrictions on the Musterfield property? I don't think any of them would prevent us from trying to save it from washing down the river. So, nothing I'm aware of, I'm going to make sure. But. Is that one on the slide? Is that the section you're talking about, the one? No. Nope. Uh, Up in the end? Yeah, the top. The top. <laughs> and that's Swansea on the side. And the campground is this part. What about in here? That's the recycle center. Oh, the recycle center. Okay, so there's a couple of locations, I believe, on town land that, that could be candidates for this um, right there. And, you know, 
it's, it's just going to help protect the neighbors, um, you know, keep things keep things flowing a little more slowly, um, keep from getting the big sandbags deposited. Yeah. In You been out there, Mike? Oh yeah. Anything we could do with the uh, the old fire department access that well, I mean, could slow yeah, things down? Yeah, I mean, you know, like Sherry said, they, they, they really, they really, <laughs> really would like to have um, the hardwoods, and we've got a little bit of time. I mean, you know, we own we the homes, it's on the land. I mean, even during that logging operation we visited last year, if we had known that then, we could have probably tagged. 10, 15 oaks and had it pushed over in no time. So I think mean, just keep our eyes open and look at our own, our own resources. I think we, sh we should be able to harvest even if we had to. And the next time somebody's building, you know, we can certainly approach them about it, but we got to get permission from them if they want. They've already got a ton of stuff, actually, they want more stuff. Who pays for moving them and the rest of that stuff will that to other people. But I don't think there's any shortage or lack of opportunity to get trees when we would want to do it. So in certain time of year, Mike, that we have to do this in the fall to, to, to hold the growth of these trees? That's up to the design guys. I'm not even going to answer that. But yes, probably. I'm sure that's true. Well, because it surprises me that we can take a big oak tree and transplant it without a dime. I mean, we no, no, we're not trying to transplant it. No, no, no. We're going to cut the top of the tree off. Got it. Now 20 feet of tree with a root ball. Right. Not the top. They stay there. That makes the yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, this is going to be. <laughs> that would be a challenge. Yes. Got to. I think consensus should be fine at this point. What do you think? Three of us okay with it? I'm fine with it. Thank you, sir. Consensus. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Code Enforcement Officer Michael Jasmine, Golden Round Range Improvement Project. All right, so the, the Grange money passed along with the rest of the CIPC stuff. So it's time to, to get on with uh, bidding the roof. We're going to do this in stage. We're going to do the roof bid first, and then we'll see how that comes back. And then we'll, we'll worry about the windows and then uh, the drainage. Those are the three things that money was supposed to supposed to buy. Um, you guys have the ARP in front of you. The only thing about that that's not accurate that I put on mine is um, the plan, my plan right now is to uh, eliminate the chimney. And the reason I have a chimney on that building, we're not going to use it. It's in very poor condition, top to bottom. Um, and it's going to make roofing a lot easier and a lot less likely to leak in the future. Um, and that's pretty much it. I'm going to send it up. Got a deadline on the 22nd. It's going to be a mandatory site meeting. Uh, pretty much. Um, the way we always do them, we'll see what the numbers come back. Um, do you know when that is? The 22nd? No. <laughs> the uh, site block, the mandatory block. Whenever, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making it, um, I'm not setting a date, it's whenever they can do it. It's just across town hall, and I'm really concerned about getting people to bid it in as it is. I don't want to limit in any way. So you as, as, as it's convenient for them. As it's convenient for them, I'll do the best I can to accommodate them. Is there any reason we can't start earlier than seven for the work if needed? Um, probably not. I mean, if it was really needed, I mean, so so you, know, you guys are kind of using my my mantra, with Mr. Compassion. Now you got three components to the construction project. You got price, you got quality, you got schedule. You get two. So in this one, we're going for price and we're going for quality. I'm, I'm, proposing to give in on schedule. And the reason is, is because we have it. We have the flexibility. We've got four or five days in here. They said that I don't want it to work. That's for their um, bluegrass festival, a couple days before, a couple days after. Um, so I'm hoping that flexibility will allow someone to view this job in a bunch of different ways, not the least of which is just as an infill project. Um, pricing and construction right now is harder than it's ever been for me. I've still been pretty successful as of late, but I'm really nervous about this. Um, because the, the largest growing cost in construction right now is a gallon of because I can. And I don't know how much that actually costs. Right? Materials, material labor, but some guys are just doing it because they can. So I don't know what it's going to come back at. You know, I want to be right. I just want to be right. But I could be way off. Is that going to be the motion? 
thing we've done in the past is uh, take this show on the road if we want to do that in some of the warmer months what something to think about yeah there's lots of places maybe the airport terminal maybe uh, Richardson Park Richardson Park yeah yep yeah. Precinct 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 if they have the tent up yeah uh, maybe after park fly season. Okay. <laughs> All right. How about uh, Stratton Free Library Expendable Trust Fund? Page 48. It's not cheap. So are they going to do it themselves? I see they got the blank barcodes, or is this something that they're buying a couple thousand barcodes and they're sending them out? That's here. I'm looking at is it page 48. That's a little bit of description. Yeah. Dumb digitally composed barcodes. Quantity one thousand. Yeah, I don't have to okay. I didn't know if you I didn't know how much you dug into it. But I don't I think it was a combination. They were gonna do some of that. Do some of those. Good. So we want to make a I'd like to make a motion on that. Um, as outlined in the agenda here. The trust fund. Does that sound good? You got that, Beverly? Okay. All right. Second. All right. Motion made and seconded to authorize the expenditure up to $12,473 from the Stratton Free Library Expendable Trust Fund. All in favor say aye. 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 And the ayes have it. Thank you. Police cruiser. So, also, the uh, capital improvement plan is for a new, new cruiser this year. Um, Chief that included some information on pricing. They found a 2023 GM Tahoe. Uh, 
2023 GM Tahoe for total cost without fitting of just over $58,000. I'll make a motion that we um, accept the um, money for the good cruiser as outlined here in the agenda. Authorize the expenditure. The what? As written. Second. All right. We have a motion and seconded to authorize the expenditure up to sixty thousand dollars from the police cruisers capital reserve fund to purchase and outfit a new police cruiser. All in favor say aye. 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 And the ayes have it. Thank you. You can bring your mic over too, Jimmy. All right. Requested expenditure, twenty twenty four reevaluation contract. 2024 is a revaluation year for Swansea, which means we're going to update all of our property values. Uh, last year we did what's called a full measure and list, which uh, has the assessing contractor attempt to visit and inspect every property in town. Um, due to the cost and the feeling that our data is overall in pretty good shape, what we're proposing this year is what's called a statistical update, which means he inspects properties that have uh, been improved, they have a building permit, or properties that have sold within the last roughly 18 months. He then takes that data, uh, updates the metrics for the, uh, that goes into the assessments, uh, develops preliminary uh, values, the letters get sent out to all property owners so they get an idea of the pre preliminary value. They would then have an opportunity to meet with the assessor and understand how that value is calculated provide additional information. If they haven't been visited and they'd like to be visited, they can do that. Um, so that's the, that's the general overview of what we're looking at. So we're looking at using uh, Marizoff assessing for that uh, project this year. So, so last year there was significant physical visitation of properties? Based on improvements or sales. But he physically went to multiple properties last year. Did I hear that correctly? Last evaluation. Oh, 2019. Correct. Okay. So this year it's it's focusing on uh, any any properties that have pulled permit building permits or sales. Right. Or yes. sales. Correct. No, in, in terms of physical visit. Correct. He's he's actually going to go out to the properties that transferred Afterwards. as well as building permits. Correct. So we'll get a pretty good cross section yep. from that. Right. I'll make the motion that we accept it as written. Second. All right, motion made and seconded to enter into a contract with Mayor's Office Assessing and authorize the expenditure up to 105000 from the Revaluations and Updates Expendable Trust Fund for a statistical evaluation of property. All in favor? Aye. 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 The ayes have it. Thank you. Rules of procedure? Five uh, minutes or less. Pretty, pretty uh, minor. So to provide them to our new selectmen, I just pulled them up and happened to read through and just noticed a few um, kind of inconsistencies. It talks about how regular meetings are at town hall, which obviously uh, is not the case currently. Uh, a couple other just rewording and reorganization. I don't think they were too controversial. If you see other stuff in there that you'd like to update, we can do that too. Um, or we can put it on hold. I just figured while I was while I was reading it, I would suggest some um, updates. So I think they look good to me. The only thing I'd like to add is to our agenda. We we, we typically allow or ask for public input at the end of the meeting. Do so like just, to add that in at the end yeah, as well? Yeah. So we'd have two shots at it. So early in the meeting and then at the end. Yeah. So it's the first by the apple and the last by the apple, right? <laughs> Sounds yeah. good to me. I like that. All right. Good job, Michael. Very good job. As usual, all right? So can Joe get his done in two minutes? Just I think you can get your bridge. Your it's bridge a biggie. It's uh, whoops. It's a 
big expenditure. So uh, recently, we updated the lights on the Sawyer's Crossing Bridge to uh, to LEDs, but some complaints about the visibility. Started getting the same complaints over here on the Slate Bridge in Westport Village. Uh, Tenney Electric gave me a quote to replace the lights on that bridge with the same ones they did on Sawyer's Crossing, which are working really well at the uh, thirteen hundred seventy-five dollars. Then all the other bridges have modern lights, so they're all, this would be the last one to bring up to date. What was, what was the complaint about? Shining in the No, the they're just dark. Oh, they're not bright. Very dark. They're basically household bulbs that are up in there, from what yeah. I can tell. So, so they're upgrading the yeah, lighting that's on. Yeah, much brighter and then LED efficient. So um, it'd be the same thing that's over on the Soros Crossing Bridge. All right. If there's no further questions, I'll entertain a motion on that. Um, I'll Up make a motion five. that we upgrade the lights for the Sawyer Crossing Bridge. Uh, Slate Bridge. Slate Bridge. Up to fifteen hundred. Up to fifteen hundred. Second. All right. Motion made and seconded to authorize the expenditure of up to fifteen hundred from the covered bridges capital reserve fund for lights at the Slate Covered Bridge on Westport Village Road. All in favor, say aye. 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 Aye, the ayes have it. Thank you. And then lastly, uh, Cottle Hill Road project improvement. Um, you know, we've talked about it in the past here about uh, widening the hill and, and paving it. Uh, we had a property owner that, that's not cooperating, but I think we're going to look into doing some surveying, and I think there's enough right of way up there to do the project. I think now would be a perfect time to do it. We had a pretty mild winter, and we didn't use a fraction of our salt budget, a real small portion of it. Uh, so I'd look to use some of the funds we saved there to complete the project. I estimate the project to be about $75,000, including gravel, paving, tree removal, and uh, and the surveying. And uh, between DBW's operating budget and then leftover from what we didn't spend on salt, I think we can accomplish that. And winter's not over yet. <laughs> no, tonight it may be coming, but, but we're still in, we're still in real good shape. So right. without that. Without those funds, we, we wouldn't be able to afford to do it this year, but I think uh, we can. But we still don't know because you don't know where the property lines are? No, no, we're, st we're still going to be able to do it. The question is how far up we're going to be able to go um, because the property owner that I initially was communicating with, he stopped communicating, wouldn't even call me back. I had heard through a resident up there that he's not going to give an easement, but in looking at the tax maps, it looks like the right of way through there is plenty wide enough. We're just going to survey it to make sure, seeing he is not cooperating, survey it, make sure that we're not doing anything on his property. Uh, but, but regardless of that, we will still be able to pave that triple portion of the hill. The hill is really steep and it's gravel. It's problematic because cars going up it, tires bouncing, it gets a lot of potholes. Uh, so it would just be paving the, the first big gravel hill on that road and then doing some other gravel improvements to call the hill dirt itself. Is it a mile? How long is it that we have to go? We're looking at uh, approximately 1,000 feet to a quarter mile of, of pavement, and then we'll do some other improvements to the rest of the gravel road. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we'll call the public informational meeting to order for hmm, reconstruction of Upper Wilson Pond Dam on Swansea Factory Road. We have representatives here from Dubois and King, the engineers, and the construction company, Gordon Services. If you could, before you uh, are recognized to ask your question, please identify yourself for the minute taker. Thank you. Or just grab it like this. <laughs> yeah. uh, good evening. My name is Charles Johnston. I am the design engineer for the Upper Wilson Reconstruction Project. I'm here with Hannah Pasquale from my office, who's a junior engineer, as well as the team from Gordon Services, who is the contractor for the project. Um, this meeting is to provide you some information about uh, the background of the project um, and information about the construction that's going to be occurring this summer. Uh, there is a handout that's going around. If you didn't get it, let us know. Hannah's got some extra copies. Um, I have an extra copy. I don't need that. Um, the overview for this is we're going to go over a little bit about what the dam is and why we got to the place where we are now um, and the process of, of alternative selection and design and 
funding for the project, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what the construction project is and the sequence in which uh, the contractor ex is expecting to complete the project. Uh, so first of all, uh, Upper Wilson Pond Dam is part of a larger system that goes down to Lower Wilson and then past the uh, airport back to the Ashwood. Um, Upper Wilson is a earth embankment dam. It has a concrete spillway. It's located on Swansea Factory Road. The dam is approximately uh, 40 feet long for the earth embankment portion, and then there is a earthen dike that actually occurs um, behind one of the uh, structures that you can see in that image. Um, it's controlled by the concrete spillway. The primary deficiency with the dam is that it doesn't have hydraulic capacity to pass the design flood that New Hampshire DES has de determined for this hazard classification of a dam. Um, in other words, when the 100-year flood comes in like we had this summer, it will potentially overtop and that could lead to a failure of the dam. Because of the structures downstream of it, it's classified as a high hazard structure, so in an event that it was to fail, it could cause loss of human life. So it is required by New Hampshire Dam Safety to be reconstructed or removed. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide. Uh, in 2017, we started the process of rehabilitating the downstream dam, which is Lower Wilson Pond Dam. Um, and during the summer of 2018, we did the construction project there. Um, that structure is located along the um, Route 32 by the airport. Um, and then COVID hit, and we had a little break. Uh, but then we came back, and we started looking at Upper Wilson. And in 2020, we started an alternative analysis, and I came and presented those alternatives to the town that included a dam removal option and then two different rehabilitation options. The, the one that was selected is the current one that we're designing, um, which is to remove the existing concrete structure and replace it with a similar concrete structure that has a longer hydraulic length and is able to actually pass flows more efficiently. That occurred throughout 2020 and 2021, um, and that alternative was selected. In the 2022 time period, there was a bond vote to move forward with the design and um, bidding. Um, after that bond vote in s September, yes, uh, the town put together a package. Um, New Hampshire DES received funds through the ARPA um, Act, I think it's, it's an act from the federal government, um, and they appropriated some of that funds to rehabilitation of high hazard dams, which Swansea received a million dollar grant towards the project. Um, so there was a $1.3 million bond vote and there's a $1 million grant. Um, we went through the final design of the project um, and we were given permits earlier this year, or sorry, in uh, 2023. Um, and we put the project out to bid earlier this year, which uh, Gordon Services had the lowest apparent bid uh, of $1.3 million for the project. The project involves uh, demolition of the existing concrete structure. We're going to excavate uh, outside of those limits to replace some of the soils and put in a, a mineral filter drain to pick up seepage or groundwater that's moving through the dam to make it more stable. There is a seven foot diameter penstock because this used to be part of a hydro facility um, that was abandoned in place. We're gonna remove that as it's a mechanism for failure. Uh, if water was to get in there and potentially leak out of it, um, it could erode the soil and you could get a breach through that section. So we're gonna remove that section out. We're gonna put in a sheet pile cutoff wall on the upstream side of the existing concrete wall that's gonna, por portion of that's gonna remain. That will help also reduce seepage through the embankment. And then uh, along the top, we're going to regrade it and we're going to put uh, topsoil and make it similar to what it's now, which is a park setting. Um, the biggest difference is the dike or the extension of the earth embankment that wraps around the pond behind the homes right now is wooded. That has to be um, 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 cut. So there's no trees or shrubs within 15 feet of the embankment and it's gonna be all lawn basically looking back there. Um, so that will be a large difference, I think, from the road if you were just driving by looking at it. Uh, I'm going to have Hannah come up. We have a couple plan sheets, and she's going to just touch upon a few key components of the project on those plan sheets. So this sheet right here is the existing condition site plan. You'll, um, in the center is the existing concrete spillway. 
Then to the left of it, there is the intake structure, uh, which leads to the seven foot diameter penstock. And then just left of that is the existing concrete retaining wall. Under normal conditions, um, Upper Lawson Pond is at 497.25 feet. On the next slide, you'll notice that during construction, this will be lowered to 494 feet. The spillway intake structure and penstock are cross-hatched because these will be demolished. And then to the right, you'll also um, notice that it's cross-hatched as well because the, the dike will be cleared of trees and shrubs at least 15 feet from the toe of the dike. Um, on the next page, or on the next slide, is a close-up look at the proposed conditions. Uh, there will be riprap upstream and downstream of the spillway. The spillway looks a little different now. It's a labyrinth spillway. There's also to the right and left sheet pile cutoff walls. And then to the left is that um, existing concrete wall that's to remain. So in the center is the um, labyrinth spillway. To the right and left of the spillway are the sheet pile cutoff walls. And then to the left, just past the sheet pile cutoff walls is the existing concrete retaining wall to remain. On the next slide, are isometric views of the new spillway to be built. On the top, uh, you'll notice the water um, this one shows upstream to downstream the flow of water. And then the other one, the other uh, spillway, is, it's the same. It's just a different view. Um, it's going from, the water is going from bottom to uh, top. Yeah, so I just want to touch upon this new structure, right? The existing structure of the water is maintained and it flows across a concrete slab and then drops off into the pool downstream of this. This one will be slightly different where the interior wall, the accordion wall, is maintaining the water level and then you're going to have a 10 foot drop. So it will be even more of a waterfall effect that there was there before. That was kind of one of the key um, public input that we got back is that the public likes to have a waterfall there. Um, so there will be even bigger waterfall, I guess, than there was before. Um, in addition to that, there will be a new pond drain system that there isn't there currently, so there will be an ability to draw this down in case there's an emergency event or a flood coming in, as well as there will be a T on that system so that if the fire department does want to, they can draw water from this pond. I think there's already an existing um, hydrant there that's attached to the town's water system, um, but this is just an extra precaution if they need more water. Um, yeah, we'll go to the next slide. This is a little bit about the construction sequence. I don't know if uh, you guys want to talk about that. That's all right. I'll do it. Um, so the plan is uh, in April and May is to start to go out to the site and lay out the controls and start to cut down trees and prepare the site for construction. In late May, we're going to start um, digging up the penstock and the old structure and demolishing it so that sometime in end of May and April, the site's prepared and ready to start putting together the forms, reinforcing in concrete for a pour sometime in July. Um, there's a little bit of a period after the concrete's been poured to let it cure, and then after that, there will be backfilling and final conditions will be set sometime in August, is my understanding. Um, and I think that's the full construction schedule. Does anyone have any questions? Questions, sorry. Correct. Yeah, if you want to go back to that sheet. Yes. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna point to this one. So the water is sitting inside these. Um, we call them. Uh, it, the, in this view, right, the water is gonna go over this wall and down in between these accordion walls, right? And you can see there's almost like a curvature to that wall right in here. That's what is helping 
facilitate the water from moving and makes it the weir more efficient. So it's a key component of the construction. There are 10 feet, three inches on the interior, these walls. And then these walls will be slightly taller. If you're standing on the embankment right now, you look down and it's just a concrete slab and water's flowing over. We've purposely sloped the um, embankment walls on the downstream side so that you could be standing on the embankment and looking across and those accordion walls will actually extend out further and you'll actually be able to see the water falling in front of you. It'll be a pretty nice site amenity. That was not included. If the town would like to add fences, they can. As well, an, how would, we, could that possibly be done with the, the way the design of the dam is? Yeah, so if you, if you go around to some of the state dams, um, because they're not regularly, um, people don't regularly go to them, I guess, from the state, right? What they've done is they'll put like chain link fence along the um, outside of the concrete so that right. people will have to purposely go around to get to them. Um, some other towns may put like a wooden guardrail or something like that. That's completely up to you if you want to do that. Um, it, but that's a town liability issue if you want to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's something that we could talk to the contractor and have them add, but it has, it's not a part of the dam safety issue, right? It's a public safety issue. Right, and I, I guess it should be noted that if they fall on this side of it, no, they're just going to be in the. It's going to be the pond. Yeah. So, so um, there's no fence. Scroll down a little bit. At the pond, you know. Everything, I mean? everything from this point across will be water. So if they were to fall off the embankment this way, they'd fall into water, and then they could be. If they swam over. I guess they could fall ten feet. From this point on, they would fall in. The wall is around nine, down to about um, three feet tall at the end here. Um, it will be ten feet deep on this side of the of the spillway. Yes. Yes. We are digging down and creating a hole. The goal is that the pond drain will be used more regularly than. Well, there wasn't one before, so it shouldn't silt in as long as we continue to use the pond drain, as well as the labyrinth has a system. The way the hydraulics work, it helps clear sediment out from the, the labyrinth during like flood events. Let's do the online one first and get that over with. They're going to be concrete, um, so if they were to have vegetation growing on them or, you know, something that you think is unsightly, you could power wash them if you wanted to. Um, if debris gets caught on the top of the weir, it is part of the owner's operation and maintenance to go and clear that, so Joe's team would have to go out and go clear that off. Um, usually there isn't a lot of debris that catches on this dam because water that flows into it has to go through the diversion channel first and that's usually where it's going to get caught or in the, tra the trash rack that controls that system. Um, I don't think a lot of debris gets caught there currently. Um, most of it is somebody like last year threw a table in there. Um, so hopefully that doesn't happen in the future. But. Yep. Yep, um, so this went through 
New Hampshire dam safety permitting as well as New Hampshire wetland and Army Corps permitting. Um, because this is a dam safety issue, it trumps the requirements for the Shoreland uh, Protection Act. Um, so we went through that process. It is a requirement for dam safety that it's cleared to the water's edge, to the top of the dam, and then on the downstream side of the embankment um, to within 15 feet of that embankment. Uh, uh, the process that we went through it is not. The dam safety program requires that to occur. Uh, question in the back? Yeah, Eric, I have two more ones. Um, you said that this option was uh, chosen or approved. Uh, what process was involved in choosing or approving that? Yep, so we went through uh, a period of information gathering. We went and did survey, we did updated hydrology and hydraulics. Um, and we did some analysis. We presented, a, I think it was four different options here at a select board meeting um, initially, and then we did a secondary um, uh, meeting, which the public was invited to, and we received uh, input at those meetings. I'm not sure how much input we received, but then the select board uh, made a decision, and we went forward with the rehabilitation option. you want to scroll up to the next page, it might be easier to look at the site plan. So the pond sits up in this area, right? And it'll be flowing this way. We have a riprap channel that will be connecting with the riprap that was designed for the culvert, and it will funnel through this and then down the rest of the stream back down to Lower Wilson. So where is the, where is the riprap channel or culvert? Is it included in that accordion structure or is it below it? The culvert through Swansea Factory Road currently exists, and it has. That's, that's, that's downstream of the, of the dam itself. Correct. Yes. So, the gentleman brought up a point that I was going to ask about the debris and sticks and trees and logs and steel soap and stuff is going to start building up. It's going to fill up all of those, uh, all of those recording B channels. Yeah. So, floating debris yeah. will get caught on the debris channels. Yeah. It is the town's responsibility to remove that, that material, similar as it is today, or in other, any other option of the dam maintaining with this kind of structure. Um, silt, because dams allow water to calm, will deposit in that accordion channel. There is a pond drain located on this side of the structure, which is roughly five feet below the bottom of the pond. So we've dug down and created a pocket so that when you open the pond drain, you can flush water and whatever s accumulates in that area through that pipe. In addition to that, because of the accordion hydraulic system, right, when there's more water passing over it, it lifts material from below and deposits it on the other side. So it's considered self-cleaning. Similar to a skin or like the leaves would float over the top. Correct, yeah. So you don't have a lot of pull low. You have a lot of the water pulling from over the top. Correct, and it creates almost like a negative pressure that pulls material. Yeah. That's pretty Yeah, I mean they have it. They, there's other dams in New Hampshire that have it, and they're pretty. This, this is yes. Yeah. There's also another labyrinth system, which it's not an accordion like this. Instead, they're they're rectangular accordions, um, and they're almost like fuse gates that will fall in certain. Storms. I didn't want to create something that was going to cost the town constant costs, so we didn't go that route. Um, but yes. Uh, Jay Moore, first one. Um, on this one, we have, we, we, at the previous meetings, we, we were told that there's going to be, while the dam is under construction, the flow would be about the same. Because yeah. you're going to have a bypass channel. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? We have two other concerns. Yeah, the contractor and I are going through setting up a control of water plan. The intention, though, is that there will be a slight drawdown, approximately three feet, right, to assist with drying out the area that they're going to be doing the construction in. Then there will be 
I believe right now what's being proposed is a culvert system similar to like Lower Wilson where water can flow through that pipe and get to the downstream channel and continue down to Lower Wilson Pond. In an emergency situation like we had in the floods this summer, I believe there's going to be a pilot channel and sheet plastic used to protect the dam if it was to overtop. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna sidestep that a little bit, right? Uh, I am not aware that the soils within Upper Wilson are contaminated. We did not do testing of the soils as part of this project. When we were talking about dam removal, the state requires that because it could be, right? Because sediment tends to settle at dams and if there was contamination in the water, you could have contamination in the pond, right? But we, nobody actually knows that. There was no testing, unless you've done it, but I, I didn't. <laughs> Well, well, I still need to finish your question, right? Beyond that, right, the, the control of water plan and erosion control plans will require that water moving through the project site be clean water and go through turbidity curtains and treatment. So the water that's transporting downstream should be just clear water that The town. Okay. Or town. <laughs> yeah. Um, to be fair, the, the goal is to be able to take whatever flows that are coming in, because we're not, I don't believe the intention is to close off the um, diversion channel, is to take whatever flows that are coming in and transport them through the project, right? Um, so, yep. Is that it? Excellent. Yep. Oh, yes. Yeah. We're not, yeah. We're, we're not lowering Lower Wilson. We are not going to lower Lower Wilson Pond. The flows that come into Upper Wilson are supposed to be maintained and transmitted downstream. So there should not be a significant difference in Lower Wilson Pond. If there was a drought, for example, at the beginning of last summer there was one. I understand there was some concerns, right? There's, there's not a lot that can happen here, right? Whatever flow gets into the diversion channel is what goes down to Lower Wilson Pond. That system is not changing how that works. Yeah, yeah. It's true. Yes, initially there's going to be about three feet drawn off, so the flows will be greater than they usually are, but not like a flood flow. It'll be just more. Yep. Up above the upper pond, you got the branch river, right? Yes. And then you've got on the branch river, there's a piece that comes off. Is that what feeds the upper? Yep. If you want to go up to. Where I saw the wood. Yeah. So, there's a there's the railroad crossing that goes across the Branch River, right? Yeah. Um, just downstream of that, there's a low head dam. So it's only about four feet tall, maybe three feet. It's not very tall. Right. You can walk across it. There's an intake channel there with a trash rack and a gate so that you can force water to Upper Wilson. 
Um, but it's limited to whatever water can get through that channel and whatever is happening in the branch river. That transports to Upper Wilson. Water in pushes water out. That goes to lower. Lower is a little bit different, right? It's an earth embankment dam, so it can actually get higher than the intake structure, and then that goes past the airport. When you cut off, In 2017, uh, 2018, when we did repairs to Lower Wilson, we also did repairs to the diversion dam town-owned per portion. I don't know how to really define it, right? Uh, there is a concrete intake box that the trash rack lies on, and the trash rack was removed and cleaned, and a new trash rack was put in, and then we also put in, you know, uh, some walkways that were safe for the town, town um, workers to get to it um, before they were just rotten logs. And then we also replaced the wastegate. So the wastegate is probably the best control you have, right? If you close that, it could potentially raise the water level going over um, the diversion dam, which would increase the water level that's going into the diversion channel. Um, but those improvements were made. The diversion channel has not been improved. Yeah, the, ten, the, the, the depth requirement, yeah, the depth requirement was something by the dam bureau. Uh, the concrete structure and the improvements that are made to a dam need to be founded upon native soils. And they don't count the current soils there as native. They're talking about what was there before the dam even existed. So the reason that's founded so deep, it has to sit on that original ground, which is that depth. Um, I would agree, I guess. I don't want to get in trouble here, but when I walked the, the, the diversion channel in 2017, you could see the original logs they used for, for um, supporting that channel. And I think if you walked it nowadays, it is more silted in. It's what? More silted in. Oh, absolutely. Yep. Any, any other questions? Anybody online? With a hand raised or anything? No. I have a question, sir. Um, I live on Lyon Ridge Road, and I live right across from the inlet, and the water is really low. And um, are you going to be able to raise the water so I can get my kayak in or not? Because my, my dock is dry, and so is my neighbors that own a pontoon boat. And it has to do with also with Marky and Jim, you know, all the way down. Are they, are, are do, you, do you live on Upper Wilson Pond? So on Lower Wilson by Route 12, it is lowered in the winter, and I provide a memo to the town. Is it going to be high enough, though, so we can get our... Yes, it's brought back up, it's brought back up at, on April 15th because we bring it down so that when there are floods or runoff in the spring, the dam doesn't overtop. So eventually, I believe April 15th is what Joe's saying, it's going to be brought back up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I, I think I understand what Stone was confused before. If I remember hearing correctly, the dam is 10 feet, but a little good portion of it is below the, the current bottom yeah. of, the, of the pond, not the Wilson yeah. pond. So it's not going to be 10 feet up, up above the current bottom of the Wilson pond, uh, upper Wilson pond. It's going to be partly below, below it. So only how much feet will be sticking up? 
Yeah, if you walk out there right now, it's about a foot deep, right? The concrete is matched with the bottom. It does slope away. Um, it's gradual. There are parts of the pond that are about eight feet deep, right? And they're just upstream of that. And then as you work your way north, <laughs> it's only a foot deep again, right? It's pretty much just a mud bog, right? Where that structure is being taken out is we're going 10 feet down, right? Because the dam embankment is between 8 to 12 feet tall, right? If you were to stand on the road and look across, it's taller than you are, right? So we have to actually get down to the native soils that are below the embankment and found the structure and whatever new improvements are going in that soil. Yeah, if you were to stand, I mean, I was standing on the spillway two years ago um, doing borings in it. You could just step off and walk right into the muck, right? Because it's right there. We're going to excavate all that down, especially where the penstock is. I mean, it's two feet below the ground and then it's seven feet deep to get to the bottom of the penstock. All of that's coming down, and then we're going to replace that with concrete walls. So it'll be deeper in that section, but as you move upstream, it will come back up. And then as we flush it, maybe some of that sediment gets pushed downstream. Well, if it gets closer to the according dam, Joe is going to flush it, theoretically, twice a year or more, and he can flush that sediment out. And then if we do get a flood, which we typically do every year, some level of flooding, it should self-clean itself. So there's no um, mechanical devices on this at all? Not, nothing that we can change heights? There, no? Well, there is, currently there is nothing. I mean, you are not to open that gate. <laughs> You've been told not to. The new dam, there will be. There will be a pond drain because you're required to have one. You're supposed to be able to dewater your pond in case of an emergency. So there will be a gate valve, a system of gate valves that you can open and drain the pond. You can also open a gate valve and draw water off for fire protection. So we're going to cut the same body of water. Exactly the same. Same size, the body of water. Same size, same water level. Yep. Charlie, could you explain the reason for the accordion dam and that yeah. instead of a dam that wide, yep. it's that wide, but it's... Right. Accordion. So this dam currently, um, we call it them weirs, right? Water flowing over a structure is considered a weir. Um, the way it currently is, it, it's a straight weir. It goes from concrete wall to concrete wall. And it can only put out, it can only flow so much water based upon its length and technically it's breadth upstream to downstream. So this one's even worse because it has an extra width, right? Um, if we were to cut that down to only be one foot wide upstream to downstream, it's still limited by its length. By going to an accordion style, we end up creating more length in the same left to right foot footage. So initially, that weir can flow more water. As the water comes up, yes, the accordion style becomes less efficient, but still more efficient than just a straight weir. So we're essentially, earlier in the storm, we're able to push more water through so that the water level doesn't increase and overtop the dam. So like if you took that accordion and just stretched it out, it'd be this wide. Correct. Right, all those walls. Yeah. So I've got, let's say, 100 feet left to right, and I'm fitting about 330 feet of length in that. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, if you and your associate can just give Beverly your names yes. for the record. Yeah. Thank you. All right, moving on to appointments. We have Cheshire County Administrator Chris Coates and EMS Chief Chad McMurray. Thank 
There's a microphone at the red seat there, if you like. So I'm gonna, if it's all right, um, just is it all right to speak standing, or do you want me to sit? Uh, I'm, I'm good standing, if that's all right. So um, we we come before you. I know that the EMS is the conversation, but we also would be remiss if we didn't report out. Uh, first of all, we ask that at some point we can come back to you and just talk about county as a whole because there's a lot of things going on in the county and we're excited to be able to tell our, our story, what's going on. But I will tell you that on Monday of this week, the uh, delegation came together after the commissioners in December had moved forward a budget. You know, it's, of course, it starts with the uh, department heads and ourselves creating the budget. And last year, if you remember, we passed a budget that had 0% of, uh, zero percent increase to taxes to be raised from the county's portion of the budget. Yeah, this, this week we passed a budget that is a negative 0.09% of increase of taxes to be raised from the county's portion of the budget. There's a lot of work that we put into this. Um, I brought you a look, uh, um, some information that um, we have Director of Finance Cheryl Trombley here tonight. She can talk to this too, um, but that will show you that over a 10 year period where we've come from and, and, and where we're at. And, um, we understand by statute that there's certain services we have to do, we have to give. We also know that in the last three or four years, the marketplace, when it comes to um, salaries and wages, have been all over the places. But we've worked extremely hard to also understand the fiscal realities that we're, we're under as we move forward. So I wanted to bring you this tonight just to share with you. When we come back, we can talk about it more in depth. And Cheryl, is there anything that you would want to to say, I will tell you this, though, just because we give you a zero-based budget that we send it up to the Department of Revenue Administration, we, but we've done our job. They then take a look at all 22 towns' valuations in the city of Keene. That's about $12 billion, just under, it's about $11.9 billion. They take your valuation and divide it by the, the 11, uh, 11 billion and, and change, and that's your apportionment that's assigned to you that you pay towards the, city, uh, towards the county. So we don't have a lot of control of that. You have a rolling five-year evaluation process that goes on, and so we just want to make you aware that when we do our due diligence, it's when we create the budget and we send it out the door, then we lose, sort of lose control of it. And it's a process that we can talk about it greater depth because I know that's not what we're here tonight to talk about. But again, if at some point, Michael, if you want to invite us back to and talk in length about some of the programming that's going on within the county, we'd love to have that opportunity. And we can also send in this to you electronically if you choose to. taxes to be increased has gone uh, has risen by 0.68% uh, in the last 10 years it's 2.19% so my predecessor who sits here tonight and then myself we take great pride in trying to understand the circumstances we're in and try to then ensure that the services are at the highest quality for those that are in need and at the same time meeting the needs of our community so with that being said, I'm going to, um, tonight we have Commissioner Clark, Commissioner Wozniak, uh, Cheryl Trombley, our, our Director of Finance, Chad McMurr, our Interim um, Chief for EMS, and Mark, is where, oh, and Mark Kramer, who's our Deputy Chief, and also uh, Chad Butler, who is our um, Jeff all trade for us now, we're doing all kinds of different works, and he's the one that's going to really develop some things that I think will help moving forward, tell our story around the Cheshire EMS, but Chief, if you want to tell the, start telling the story, then sure. it may come back to us when it comes to finance, and, and, and Cheryl and I can, can talk a little bit about that. And I don't know if you can have the, to have the ability to put anything in to show up there if you want. Okay. So, 
I'm just going to have Chad plug in, or if you want to, Mr. Administrator, to So, thank you for having us here tonight. My name is Chad McLaren, I'm the Interim Chief at EMS here. This is our data from last year. All right, the important thing to remember about last year was we didn't start doing the 911s, especially for Swansea or throughout the county, until July 1. All right, with that, this is only half of the year. Data. We, this year is our big year as far as collecting data points and moving that forward. So to my understanding, there are some questions about receiving our data in real time and what Chad Butler has set up for us through our county website to retrieve that data and what it actually means. Is that a correct summation? Well, I, did, or? I did try to look on the website and wasn't able to, I wasn't able to figure it out. Okay. Right, but just honestly, to, and just to give an update in general. Yeah. So I, I think showing and showing how to navigate to the response data that we have up on the county website now under our department link will show an awful lot of an update for us. All right. We continue to be a 24-7 emergency service for the town of Swansea, along with other contracted towns for primary ALS and BLS or paramedic level calls and EMT level calls, along with backup for five other towns, plus the city of Keene and their towns for paramedic intercept and again, backup transport. Swansea is by far our largest call volume center and we'll, the data will show that it continues to be that way. Uh, we've, started to build a good rapport with your fire department, the police department as well, as we've been growing over the last year and a half, and certainly the last year since we started with the 911 contract. Um, I know Chief Matson uh, made a comment to us at that structure fire a few weeks ago on how grateful he was that we were there to have their backs if something knock on wood, where to happen. Uh, so we're continuing to develop and nurture those relationships. Uh, myself included, I'm in a learning curve here. I'm, I'm a field operator, I have been for a long, long time. So taking this step into the administration role is a little bit uh, new to me. So if I stumble, my apologies. But I'm here if you need me, if anyone needs a paramedic. Right. And I brought another one with me, and a third. So see, I'm prepared. Anyway, <laughs> so the new and improved Cheshire County website, if you go to departments, there we are under EMS. Scroll down, you have that top point of response data is the last one, and that's what we're really here for. But it tells us tells you about our mission and our vision on how to continue to respond to the citizens of Cheshire County. So this data, all these data points are from what's called Image Trend, which is a state-born website. It's where our reporting, so any EMT, paramedic, AEMT in the state creates a, what's called a PCR or patient care report through Image Trend and NHERS, which is how we do all our paperwork to document our patient encounters. So we were able to extrapolate certain things. This is a breakdown of year to date from January 1, 24 through December of 24. This gets updated every time one of my crews hits complete on a call that was done in Swansea. And this is, holds true for all of our towns. So any, anyone can go in and look at what we're doing. This breaks down the days of the week and the hours of the day. It shows where the most call volume comes, okay? As you can see, the darker areas are higher volume times. So at noontime on Wednesdays, the possibility of having up to nine calls going on is there. 
This looks at all the data throughout the entire year so far and, and pushes it all together. All right, so it, it's fairly sporadic, which is the nature of our business. This is set on a timer, so we'll be up there for about. I paused that. There's oh. a play pause button in between the navigation and the top right hand corner. So normally this is on a loop, runs for each page will be up for about 60 seconds, and then I'll switch to the next one, or you can physically go through it and click to the next slide. Again, just a pie chart of showing the type of location that we're responding to. The majority is homes or private residences, then apartments, and it breaks it down so you can see what type of calls are, where we're responding to, all right? The street or highway ones would obviously mean more of a motor vehicle crash or some type of incident with that uh, to help show where uh, different things may need to be done. If the police were looking at a certain intersection of, hey, how many times are we responding to accidents here? They have their data, they could ask us for, they could look at this and be like, yeah, they're starting to intersect, so maybe we can mitigate that somehow. All right. So I'm told the colors are set by image trend. All right, we're going to work on that and try to get a better color scheme going for this. So the top bar graph is Cheshire County EMS, all right? Our average time of total time on task, all right? Once we respond, and don't forget there's a process. So the second that you pick up 911, call 911, it doesn't go to Southwest Mutual Aid and Keene. It goes to Concord, to their switchboard where they start the process of what's called EMD, or Emergency Medical Dispatching. They start asking questions, they confirm your name, or your phone number, your address, all right? They repeat it back to you to make sure that if something happens and that line goes dead or you hang up, they can call you back and elicit more information. Once they confirm that, they'll send more information, they'll send that information to Get closer to oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was projecting well enough. <laughs> Thank you. Once that information is sent to the local area dispatch, that's when they hit the tone for a Swansea fire in Cheshire County EMS. Okay? And from our point, our out of shoot time is always important because that's a time from when the tone drops to when my crew signs on with 415 saying Cheshire or County A4, we're en route to 123 Main Street. I don't even, I don't believe there is a 123 Main Street, so we're safe for HIPAA. Um, we're en route to 123 Main Street for the metal. Yeah, I don't know if you can read it all as you go through, I'll read it out Current shoot time for Swansea is 54 seconds. So, so from you the, just define shoot time. Yeah, I was just going to ask yeah. that. So that is from, like I said, when the tone drops, when 4 and 5 presses, presses that button to transmit an alert for Swansea Fire and us, that starts the clock. So you, it you ends. Say, so how long does it take to get out of the garage? 54 seconds. Okay, that's it. So that's like pulling your parachute, shoot, shoot down. Right. Yes, yeah, that exactly. And sense. that's where it comes from. Right. It makes sense. So, that's to when they sign on with 415, that shoot time stops. It's pretty fast. It could be faster, and I'll talk to my crews about that. <laughs> all right. Um, so now our route time. As we all know, distance in this area is not anyone's friend, because it takes a little bit to get really anywhere. Our average on scene time from the time we call on and are moving to the time we arrive on scene is what? Seven, seven minutes and 30 seconds. Seven minutes and 30 seconds. National average per, uh, I'm gonna screw this up because I'm not a firefighter. Uh, NFPA, I believe is the acronym. Nine minute response time. Seven and a half. Seven and a half. 
how do you come to this average? How many, how, how do you, how many do you average out? Like, is it thousands or? Every call that we do in Swansea goes into this average. Oh. From, Jul from January 1st of this year to right now. So this could conceivably update if one of our crews completed, and I know we had a couple calls earlier this evening in Swansea. So as soon as they hit complete on there, it goes into the average. So you don't want to see a 10 minute one? No, I don't. Average average. 10 minute, if it's down on the Richmond line, that I could understand, all right? If it's at, say, six, <laughs> 64 Lake Street, it better be about 25 seconds. <laughs> and it has been. It has, yes. So just to make note, the bottom bar graph is the 90th percentile. That's the rest of the state that we're being compared to right there for our response time from when the unit signs on responding to arriving on scene. <clears throat> so that average looks like what? 13 minutes, four seconds. So we're almost cutting that in half for your for the town of Swansea right now. The average is 13. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. So the next uh, line you'll see is patient contact time. What this means from the time the ambulance arrives on scene to when we get to that patient's side. Because let's not forget, we're rural, it, they could be in a recreational area where we have to hike up to get them on a trail, we have to get into their house, sometimes we have to literally break into their house to gain access to make that patient contact. So again, our, that time from getting out of the ambulance, grabbing our gear, getting to the patient's side is looking at about two minutes. And seven seconds. All right. So now we've made patient contact. This is the point that pre-hospital care starts. This is that extension of the emergency room that helps with that continuum of care for all our citizens. All right. The moment one of my EMTs or paramedics or AEMTs gets there, and just to clarify the difference, EMT is your first rung in the EMS provider level. It's basic life support. It's, they can use an AED, all right? That we, I know there's a sign here that says there's an AED in this building. So an EMT basic could grab that, knows how to use it, shock the person that's in a cardiac arrest, whose heart is stopped, and start that life-saving chain to get them the best outcome possible. Advanced EMTs, they can do a bit more. They can start IVs to give certain medications. They can help a patient breathe more easily through medications and different devices. Then you have the paramedics. That is truly minus a few things and a more controlled setting, an emergency room physician at your bedside. Okay? So that would be the top. That is the top. Okay, now depending on how the call comes in through their dispatch based on those questions that they're asking, we may just send an EMT for your loved one who just fell, isn't complaining of any injuries, and just needs a hand getting back up. Okay? But that EMT can still do an, will still do an assessment and make sure that there aren't any other concerning injuries that the patient may not understand or feel at that particular moment. And they can always call for higher levels of care to come and help and assist. If you have chest pain, shortness of breath, and based on those questions, how they ask, Anything that would quote unquote be a Charlie level, which is what those questions will help dictate, and that's a whole different presentation, just so you know. I'm giving you the Cliff Notes version. We're going to send a paramedic automatically, just to make sure that 
it's not needed, the paramedic is not needed, but they're there if they are. So now we're on at scene time. Like I said, this is where that pre-hospital care has been initiated. They're starting with an assessment, they're starting to do interventions and take care of the patient right then and there. We're at about 21 and a half minutes, 21, 25, I believe is our average time. That could be longer, depending on how sick the patient is. Because like I said, we're bringing the emergency room to that patient's side, all right? So a lot of the data currently in pre-hospital care is you stay on scene a bit longer and stabilize. You treat the patient there. That paramedic is gonna reach in his medication box and start treating the patient just like a doctor would in the emergency room. So back in the day, it was kinda, oh, the ambulance shows up, throw them in the back, go to the hospital. Those days are behind us, all right? Because the evidence and research has shown it's better to stay, provide the proper appropriate level of care for that patient at the bedside before you transport to the hospital and the like. So about 20 minutes, that, that's a fair average. And then our transport time, 14 minutes, 14. about 14 minutes and four seconds. Once that care has been established, nine times out of 10, the ambulance is gonna turn off their lights and go to the hospital with the flow of traffic. That's one thing that our medical director from Cheshire Medical Center has wanted us to do because lights actually aren't all that safe. All right, it's putting more people at risk if we're driving through with lights and sirens more so than just with flow of traffic. All right, because we're able to take care of that patient from the scene into the back of the ambulance and to the hospital more effectively and safely just by going the flow of traffic, right? Then we arrive at the hospital and within about, looks like about five minutes or so. Six minutes, 55 seconds. Where <laughs> that unit is now pretty much back in service and ready to respond to the next call. So we're looking at just about an hour Roughly from the time you call 911, get shuffled around through the Peace app, which stands for uh, public safety, phone, and address, or address and phone. It's how they, your address and phone number pop up on the dispatch screen in Concord, and then over in Key. And I was told this has a lot of industry jargon in it. I'm trying to put it into layman's terms as best possible, but also educate. Because over the years, that's what I've found. No one really knows what EMS does other than they come to, the, come to the ambulance, they come in, they do some stuff, they put you in the ambulance, and they take you away. All right? Where, versus fire departments and police departments, you know, they have a, a much more robust community education program which I'm hoping to change here in the next, at least in my tenure here at Cheshire EMS, of educating as much as making sure that we're responding and serving the citizens of Cheshire County. So I hope that explains the, this graph a bit more. Uh, the next one, there was an update with the reporting service that's being rolled out in the rest of New Hampshire is going to start using it uh, by the end of April. We started testing it early for the state. That's why you see uh, 155 calls now. It was one, see, it was 146 this morning. Right. Um, that says no value. That's because the data points that we put in got changed in this update. All right, but this basically breaks it down of what type of calls you're seeing. So there's 22 BLS care, and the patient was transported in that ambulance that arrived on scene. Uh, there were seven calls that were canceled on scene with no patient contact, meaning we get there, the fire department or police department's there, 
oh, hey, it was a good intent call, there's no one home, or they said they're fine, they don't need us, and they cancel us before we make that patient contact. All right, and it goes on, on down the line. Uh, most of our transports are to your Cheshire Medical Center, and that stands the reason, because we're very close to Cheshire. The other ones, it could be we go to Brattleboro, we go to uh, Athol Hospital. So one, it's the patient has the right to request what hospital they go to, all right? And based on the, the field practitioner's assessment and how, quote unquote, sick, or how we would say acute the patient is, we can oblige by that and say, yep, we're, we can take you there because it makes more sense. That's where your, your doctor is and the like, so we have that continuum of care for the patient. If somebody's really in need to care for us, and you refuse that, you go to Cheshire. We will go to the close, closest, most appropriate facility, which to that, it may very well be Cheshire, or we're going to call for a helicopter and say, we need a helicopter, this patient is having a heart attack, they need to go to this, to a, what, a place that has what's called a cardiac catheterization lab to definitively treat that patient. We may do it by the way of Cheshire Medical Center so that that patient can get a, one more medication on or given to them before the helicopter gets there, but we're gonna be moving as efficiently and safely as we can to get that patient to definitive care. Again, this is just a breakdown of the type of calls that we're going to, and with the update, this hasn't quite caught up yet. Um, They're working on it um, because this is a relatively new software for the company as well. Um, for some reason, because you can see year to day changes on the graph, right? So as we approach June, you'll start seeing those numbers transcribe over unless they can fix it before that. So you can see more accurate representations of those year to day changes. Which is nice from a public health standpoint. Yes. And again, just most of the calls right now we're looking at. Uh, are at the BLS or that EMT level. Paramedics, we've had about 17 calls in that in the last uh, couple months, and it breaks it down to also the AEMT level of patient that is at a level. So it's gonna give you that idea of how sick your residents are when they're calling 911. And again, that no value one will be updated as soon as they fix that little glitch in the data so points. Yes. Uh, so, I hope that helps. The last part is a heat map. All right, this is pretty cool. So it's showing us where most of the call volume is. And as you can see by the shaded areas where the county decided to put our station initially, it was a pretty smart choice, all right? Hence our fantastic response times in your town, all right? That being said, it's still centrally located throughout the county so that we are able to respond to our other uh, communities as quickly as possible. And there is a lot more color on here, just the, the projectors struggling yeah. a little bit. There's a bunch of purple here, yeah. out here, out here, and so on. And this is about as far as you'll be able to zoom in on your end, because we do want to protect patients' privacy, which still kind of boggles my mind a little bit, because dispatch sends out the resident's last name along with the address when they send it. I'll work on that too. <laughs> um, but it's, it shows you a very real depiction of where the calls are happening in your community since January 1. And we'll continue to do that as soon as our crew members hit complete on their run.
on their PCRs. Yeah. So that's the rundown on the data. Like I said, you can go to the county website under departments for EMS and follow the links and hopefully that gives a bit more of an understanding of what this says. And we're gonna edit it uh, for color and label it a little bit better as we're able uh, through image trend and the state. Current status. Current status. Staffing. Staffing. Well, we are. Buzz on that. Yep. I was just going to thank him, but uh, my, going. my question, which is still, still outstanding, I was looking for the data for last year. Doesn't look like that's on there. It is not. We are working to get last year's data up there, but what's in front of you, Mr. Administrator, is last year's data, and it's broken down by town. Not quite in this detail, but it does have how many responses we've had in your town from July of last year until December 31st. And if I'd like it in the format that we had discussed when we agreed to the contract, would that be through you or Chad or Chris? That would be through me, I'll facilitate okay. it and we'll get that Great. to you. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, this, is, this is awesome information. Just point. And hopefully moving forward in the future, this surpasses the contract as far as the reporting that is required by it. You know, like, you know, I personally, I would love to say I don't want any responses <laughs> because that means someone's having a bad day. All right, but yes, you're you're the top. But yeah. based on population and and the like, and ages and ages, every, everything goes into play. We have a much more aged population throughout the county. We have a more, cult I don't want to say culture, uh, economically diverse population. So all these things go into what happens and why 911 is initiated and, called, and ambulances are, are needed. Thank you. And my question is, is it too soon to find out if the business plan is working as you'd hoped? And are the interfacility transports where you think they were initially? Um, 911, is that more or less than you thought? And collections, that. you know, the. Yep. I'll speak to that. Uh, I'm Cheryl Chomley. Hi, Cheryl. How are you? Good to see everybody. So, um, in reflecting in 2023, some of it is a little too soon to tell. Um, we did not start taking. We did not start taking the um, 911 contracts until July 1. We did have Westmoreland as of April. The interfacility transfers, I would say, are are very much um, where we would expect them to be. There have been um, in our gross billings, but gross billings are not something to gauge because that's not what we end up collecting, but we did end up having gross billings of um, uh, approximately 6.5 million. As of the end of 2023, between those gross billing, billings, we collected about two, a little over 2 million and we're still collecting for 2023. It's a cash basis um, when it comes to um, the the, the payments for ambulance billings uh, until they get billed out either to the insurance companies, to Medicare, to Medicaid, to the private pay citizens and whatnot, you don't end up um, achieving your cash flow until it comes in hand. Over 2023, we were with a certain billing company that we actually ended up um, ending um, our, our business with. We're still using them for run out claims, but we have since gone to another billing company. The billing company, um, some of the advancements, uh, enhancements that we're gonna end up seeing with this new company that we were um, dealing with with the previous company is our interfacility transfers. They didn't see any of them as um, uh, advanced emergent calls. They saw every transfer going from one, uh, from Cheshire Medical to another one as a non-emergent call and 
you know, that was just one example of something that we could not get them to understand. The new company recognizes that predominantly the majority of the calls of the transports that are going from Cheshire to another facility ours because, is because they need a higher level of care and they cannot be taken care of and they are emergent. So that's going to be an enhancement that we've only started working with this billing company as of our claims for November 1st. Um, another positive is the Medicaid rate has um, essentially, I think, doubled to be closer to the Medicare rate and we, um, just with the natural flow of Medicare, there is going to be a slight increase in the Medicare rate reimbursement. This company, in addition to us starting to see more of our interfacility transfers coming in at a reimbursement rate of um, an emergent versus non-emergent, they also accept credit cards. The other company didn't, and um, and their turnaround time in the billing is just well, it's it's days rather than the, our previous billing company was like six to six weeks to almost two months behind, and so we've we've had um, we've had growing pains. There's no doubt. Um, more recently, and this is no fault of the company we're working with, they. The clearinghouse that they present all our claims through it was one of the largest hacks. Um, and so they have not been able to send any of our claims out for probably a good month and a half. They finally have been able to get um, a, a good chunk of the insurance ones out as of yesterday, but they're having to re, um, redo all the um, electronic data contracts for Medicare and Medicaid. So there just seems to always be one thing after another to be able to really give a good sense of where, you know, where we are. But there's no doubt 2023 was startup. It was startup. We, uh, we, we, we were ready to roll as of January 1, 2023. So we were ramping up for something that obviously didn't um, ha happen until July 1. So there's, you know, 2024 will be our, um, our year to, to really have a better sense of how the, um, the, the program is running as far as financially in support of the expenses. But we used um, ARPA funds in 2024, 2023. We have a small amount that we're using in 2024 for the subsidies that we did promise um, and um, allow for the, the town contracts. We also have those for 2024. Um, five, mm -hmm. um, and so that's really the, the update on the finances. Great, thank you. Cheryl, sure. what's the difference between emergent and not emergent? Non I can that. <laughs> okay, well, I'll let him <laughs> to speak to that. So, when we think of 911, we think of emergencies throughout, okay? When it comes to the interfacility transfers, you have a couple different levels. You think of it as you're taking a patient from a safe environment, putting them in an unsafe environment, which is how we get between the two facilities, ambulance or air ambulance, what have you, to a safer environment. What Cheryl said earlier of the billing company understand, our new billing company understanding that the patients that we're bringing to Dartmouth and Lebanon Concord Hospital, Bay State Hospital down in Springfield, Mass. Um, sometimes Albany Hospital of New York. They're going for what's called a higher level of care. It's that continuum of care that Cheshire Medical Center cannot provide. So they have to be sent to a higher level of care for either a medical issue or a trauma issue, all right? Because Cheshire Medical just doesn't have certain specialties on staff 24-7 to handle these type of patients. So that's where we come in in the interfacility transfers to take them to that higher level of care. Going to that higher level is an emergent transport because if they stay in that safe environment without getting to that safer environment, the, the odds of them declining go up. So us taking them to that safer environment, that higher level of care, is in a way is basically an emergency. It's almost like a nine one one all over again. Correct. Except for that, you don't have to have the person at home. It's the the, right. the, the facility saying we need this person transferred because 
the, the care. Um, Chief, can you just give a couple and then, of examples like a heart attack, yes. a instant, uh, yeah. a stroke? So, and just to clarify what a non-emergent is, so the patient has been seen at the hospital and now needs to go to a nursing home or a rehab facility to continue their care, to get better, to come home, that would be a non-emergent. So the type of emergencies that we're talking about is you have a heart attack or what's called a ST elevation MI in medical terms. You have to get to that cardiac cath lab so that the narrowing in your blood vessel in your heart that is narrowed, they can go in and open it up so normal blood flow can get to the rest of the heart muscle. That's where you hear all the commercials for uh, you know, time is muscle, make sure you have a AED around so that you can get them out of those lethal rhythms, or the uh, time to act fast commercials for strokes, that's another emergent transfer because they can go in and either give them medications or like a, heart, like a heart attack, they can go in and it's like a little Chinese finger cuff that they go in, they insert, and that expands that blood vessel so that they can get that blockage out or that narrowing out and allow more blood flow through either to the heart or to the brain. So the, these are time sensitive patients and like Cheryl said, it's basically a 911 call all over again. It's just the scene is the hospital and our destination is an hour and a half or so away. And depending upon the hospital's capacity, a non-emergent might be they simply don't have a bed. If there's a bed an hour away, hmm. same level of care, they just don't have room. So there's been a lot of times where the emergency room department has just been full and they can't take any more patients. So you have to, if you want that patient admitted, they simply have to go to another facility because there's no beds available in the So from a building perspective, because <clears throat> that's how it was raised, what, what's the significance? It, why did it matter that it wasn't? It's a much higher reimbursement from the insurance for that emergent yeah. continuum of care. So that's a substantial difference. It, it is. Yeah. So, so like Cheryl said, there was a lot of growing pains and, and a learning curve, both from the county, from Cheshire County EMS, and from the towns on what actually goes into every aspect of this type of service. So not only are you delayed in getting payment, but you might be getting less payment because of the way it was categorized. Yes, Absolutely. exactly. Right. Absolutely. And predominantly, I can understand why. went out by our original biller, um, billing company, from so, the time we opened until October 31st, 2023, was at the lower level. Yeah. So the billing company actually influences them to get the emergency, get the big money? Well, I mean, that's they, why you well, move to that. You have to, no. you have to bill appro appropriately. You can't do any fraudulent billing. No. But this particular company who works out of Massachusetts, they just, they just didn't get it. Didn't get it. They didn't do interfacility transfer billings much, although they did. They did, they did work for our previous uh, another provider, but they, it, they, they just that's would not trust that. that so we really took out then I mean, so we so recognize that. We, we tried to get them to recognize the difference in the level of care. So they, just, they, they, they just couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the rate of reimbursement, we have a, we have a rate sheet. You can see that rate sheet. Simple basic transfer might be $1,000. Complex one might be $3,000. Be up from there. You get a mileage rate. That's correct. So the so more service that you provide based on how sick the patient is gets reflected in the clinical notes that you make about what you did for that patient. So you submit that, somebody looks at that and says, oh, you provided as much medication, there was a medic on board, you had certain symptomologies, you, you did certain things, you took certain interventions, and that level of care that gets provided is what is the basis for the reimbursement. So the better your clinical record is in reflecting what you did for the patient, the better the likelihood that you'll get a higher reimbursement rate. And that's another thing that we've evolved into over the last year is solidifying certain positions, all right? We now have a deputy chief of clinical services that oversees all of our quality assurance 
and insurance of looking at are the crews completing their paperwork properly? Are they trained properly? Are they understanding what they need to do? If they have questions, he answers them. Plus, he is also has been working diligently to contact different municipality departments to schedule trainings. I know Swansea has come to our trainings that we've had at our station, and they've thoroughly enjoyed them. Um, it's been a work in progress getting in contact with a lot of different people. So that's coming more and more. We, the deputy was a few minutes behind me this evening because we just received through grant fund, uh, the SAMHSA grant funding, a very uh, high fidelity medical mannequin to help us train, help us train outside departments and he, he's very excited about it. He's, I'm surprised he's kind of not so jumping in the seat right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he, he, did, he did leave it at the stage. I don't, I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, th oh, this, is, this is just one more piece that we can bring to our community outreach, to our different uh, contracted areas, and honestly, just the county in general, all right? I, I want to satisfy everyone's contracts, but First and foremost, we're here to serve the county and the citizens in it when they call 911. I don't care what address goes off when our pages go up or where the address is when our pages go off. I want to make sure that we have a trained crew going to that emergency. And that's what we're building more and more moving forward. I think one more thing to just mention that uh, I, uh, the county being involved in this is not there yet. Very hopeful that um, with a lot of advocation from the county, from um, the board of the chairman of the board, um, Jack Wozniak, that we may start seeing that we get reimbursed for non transports. There's a lot of care that is provided, mm -hmm. we don't get paid for because when 911 is called, you have to go and um, you're, you're interacting with that person, but if they don't get transported, you don't get paid. Nothing? Nothing. 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 So you tell them, and how many of you think those have been? A lot. A lot. Perfect. So but you put true. your crew in the ambulance, you head to the house, you got there, they don't want to go in the ambulance, you have to collect no money. I'll give you a better one, Mr. T. Yep. You, 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 uh, I'm an empty, right? I got it. I've been around for a little, little bit. But you, you go to the house and somebody's had a cardiac arrest. You're there with a half a dozen of your team members. You're doing CPR, administering drugs, working on them for 30, 40 minutes, right? Doing pretty possible care in their setting to bring back to life in order to stabilize them so you can transport them. If you pronounce on the scene, after all those resources are being used, you get nothing. You get nothing. Because the origins of reimbursement for ambulances for decades at federal regulatory level has been transport. You get reimbursed if you transport because the origins were we didn't have a lot of pre-hospital care. We just booted them and scooted them. And so we're I'm working, Chris is working, we're all working, it's not like it's just our effort, to uh, go through a paradigm shift at the state and federal level that pre-hospital care happens in the community and it needs to be paid for. Um, it's an uphill battle because it could be pretty expensive. Um, <clears throat> so that that's those are hearings that we're literally at today oh, okay. and, and last Wednesday to um, begin to get reimbursement at least from Medicaid for non transports, recognizing the care is provided in the community, particularly if it saves the state money by avoiding a costly hospital stay or emergency room visit. Um, so, so all of these things are coming back to Sly's question about is the formula working? I, I'm going to say yes, notwithstanding the bumps in the road that we've had with providers and, and, and cyber attacks at, at some of these brokerages and so forth. The good news is we based a lot of these presumptions on Medicare rate, which has increased. We based a lot of these presumptions on Medicaid rate, which has now doubled. 
And, and so, and we're working to increase the reimbursement for all of services, including non-transports. So, in general, the picture moving forward uh, offers more stability probably today than it did when we talked to you a year and a half ago, two years ago. <coughs> obviously, the rates still have to increase dramatically, uh, and, and obviously, we, we've had that conversation with you using the, the federal funds to smooth the increase to get to a sustainable level. Um, but, but we're working very hard to... to, to so the future's looking over. bright for you guys if we can get over these bumps. It is. It's still and that's going to help us in the long run if we continue <coughs> with you yeah. and keep the rates. Low. Yeah, it's still a very... You have a great argument. Your argument is you said that you used to go pick them up, throw them in, take them. Now you're saying you stay there. So you're doing a lot more now mm -hmm. on the scene, so you need to be compensated for that. And the good news is, the person, yeah. if, you, if you remember back to the graph, the person starts getting care within uh, it's less than 15 months from, the time. So, from our response time to the on-scene time. So all those things are good things. We're, we're just, we just uh, need to uh, do everything we can in the to, to, to soften that blow to, to mitigate the cost of this $6 million apartment. And actually, as county government, we're actually pretty well poised to influence legislation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, that never happened before. Yeah. This is happening across the board, whether you know, we're evolving on a lot of different departments. That's why we want to come back and talk to you, because you know, as of this week, we are now in four towns doing some level of, of law enforcement because towns I, I can't find the people, so they've asked us to come in and take over that, those, that, 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 that department, you know, and so the sheriff's department is, is doing that. We have the regional prosecutor program that, that's been going on for years. So Sorry, these are um, sliding into your next presentation. Yeah, I understand. Okay. Okay. And so I'm gonna bring it back yeah. around. I was getting you, Jack. Okay. Uh, but I, you know, it's, it's just that in a, in a year's time, in a year's time, we have developed a continuum of care that um, we never thought we would be in this position, but we are, but we developed a continuum of care that starts with wheelchair service. We haven't even touched on that. We work with a private vendor, SmartLife. We've helped support them, helped grow them. They were a company that was doing about 40 runs um, a month, actually, and they're now doing about three, three to 400 runs a month because we've been able to help them get up, get some, uh, some, some bands, and that's helping us. Because that means the ambulances aren't going in to pick somebody up to bring them back. They are able to take out a wheelchair van back. We also just recently gave them a wheelchair, or purchase, help them purchase a wheelchair structure so that they can do some of those calls that, that fall on the border line, EMT, or but charity. It keeps our ambulances on the road for the 911s um, uh, in, in, in facility transfers. You, you had it last year, you had 163 inter-facility inter transfers if I looked at your, your study that you did. So that's people that need to be transported out of Cheshire Medical to wherever. And wherever it isn't well, just... Or home or something where you... Oh, no, no, no. Yes, yes. Yeah. Or Lebanon. Or Albany, New York. Or Connecticut. Or New York. I mean, 176 Swansea residents. Swansea, 163 Swansea residents last year had, had, were able to... We're able to we're transfer it through the same transfer. Think about it this way: uh, 100, 176 Swansea residents went to, to the hospitals and had on stuff. At the end of the stay, they got to go home again. A lot of times, that takes a wheelchair down. So that's a much lower level of care. And so what we try to do is we use a lower cost service to get them back. And now I'm trying to get them some hundred thousand dollar ambulance. To just give some of your at home. Right. So we're, we looked at all, all the aspects. We've got it all up and running. The facility transfers. Last year, the hospital came back to us and reported out that we were about 250 runs higher than we were uh, the year prior. So I mean, we're we're getting there. But last year was a throw. Was was a was a startup year, and it, and it was we ramped up, ready to go, ready to go, ready to go. We ramped up even more because we thought we were going to be really going. And we didn't really get going with the 911 calls until <coughs> July and August. Mm -hmm. And there's an 80 to 120 day turnaround just for that type of revenue to start coming in. 
So we're learning, we, we learned last year, where we were this year, we're really understanding, starting to understand the flow of it, and it's changing all the time, but Jack is right in, in that we're up in Concord too. This is the other advantage we have, is that we can, we can work with our delegation, we can work with individuals up in Concord. We, we had six meetings with the uh, Commissioner of Insur uh, Insurance, uh, DJ Bettencourt, um, and, and his staff about how, you know, how we can get fair rates because Anthem sometimes is paying less than Medicaid. Okay? And it, it just, it, it's crazy. And it's, it's across the board why we're seeing across the board the state of New Hampshire, why we're in the crisis that we're in. And so we're trying to advocate at the same time for ourselves and everybody else that's out there. We're trying to build this. And and, and I think we're, we're getting to the point. But I also understand that in June of 2026, you're, you know, there's going to be, you know, that's when our, if this contract is up, if I rip the thing right, if, um, and we'll, prior to that, as early as we can, we want to tell you, even prior to what is in, in the, you know, in the con contractual terms, we want to, we want to be able to say, this is what we're looking at. But we also know that in the count, and from the county's perspective, we may have the ability to look at different ways to, to, to do certain things. Hopefully, you know, moving forward. But I can't look at you in the straight in the face today and say where we're going to land yet. I, I just, it wouldn't be fair because we don't know yet. We're still learning. But I will tell you that we're fully staffed right now. I will tell you that we're putting people on per diem. We're asking them if, if we can put them on file uh, because we've had this increase influx of people wanting to, to come on board with us, which is a great thing. And I will tell you that that. This guy down here and has worked incredibly hard. Mark has worked incredibly hard to develop an onboarding that we're getting praise from people, veterans, that are saying we never, we never had this because we don't want to just bring them on for the sake of bringing them on. We want to bring them on. We want them to understand our core values. We want them to understand how we're looking at everything that we're doing. And and so we're really excited to have the interim chief here and, and doing the, the magic he's doing. And and we look forward to having many years with him in, in place to going forward. And, and uh, we're in a good place from where we were a year ago. We're growing every single day and, and learning the, every the, single the day. The NHS tries to almost have a growing facility that, that we built. Is that right? Yeah. I yeah. Mean, uh, we've got six bays and I think I've got seven ambulances. And, and, and we've got, oh, so you're new, you're, you're a paramedic, you're a new solitaire, you're a new con, whatever it is. And, uh, you know, the staff is proud of it. Checking the mail there? Yeah. yeah. No, but yeah, yeah, there will be anything. You know, from a training point of view, from a, from a training point of view, and I think this came up a year or two ago, uh, we also do a lot of community training. And just by an example, uh, your, there'll be about 20 kids from the Mennonite Regional that are going to get CPR training on the 27th, I believe. And then a second class of Manhattan Regional and Keen High on April 18th. So um, I reached out, I, I do some work with the Rotary Track Club. And uh, so we've got like almost 30 of those students that want to get CPR certified. So we're yeah. going to do that. Did we do the football games? Like <clears throat> yes, we did. We covered Manhattan uh, football games. We were down here at uh, the Cheshire Fairgrounds last year. We actually a gentleman stopped by the station while I was in another meeting earlier this afternoon about the 4 H events at the Cheshire County Fairgrounds looking for it, that they have to have an ambulance for. That's going to be a discussion. Um, but we are, we're building more and more. Okay, Having the Deputy Chief of Clinical Services in place for that municipal training and he oversees our community outreach liaison. Right. We're putting that information out there as best we can and building the county website so that it's, you're able to find these things or our Facebook page so that people know where to reach out. Stop by the station. We're there 24-7. Uh, or someone is. So, and remember, we're a year and a half old. Yes. But I've, I've been in EMS for going on 25 years mostly in urban settings and much higher call volumes. What we're building here and the need that I've seen in the last year and a half since I started here, the need 
for this type of service has become abundantly clear to me. All right, I come from an area where a 20 minute transport time, I'm at a level one trauma center. All right, not at a critical access hospital that we need to treat as another 911 scene to get them to that higher level of care to continue their care. All right, we need to build this service to the proper levels to cover this 732 square miles of Cheshire County. Swansea being at the center of that and our largest call volume so far of we're here for you, we'll continue to be here for you, and we want to provide the best care we have, we can. So please provide us with your feed, feedback, let me know if there are issues. I've reached out to Chief Madsen a few times, had a few good conversations with him. I believe that rapport and relationship is building. All right. If he says something else, then that's fine. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> you know, our crews want to be there to help people, hands down. And we'll work with the county to figure out the financial aspects. But our crews will tighten up so that we are able to build as much as the insurance will reimburse us for so that we can continue to provide this care. Mm. We take up another time. Yeah. That was a great presentation. It was fantastic. You taught us a lot. You taught me a lot. There's a lot to learn. That was great. So you guys all are in that building? You have, we are. Yeah, no, we're, 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 we're there. The old courthouse. The old courthouse. Yeah. yeah. Old court yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Swing by any time. We're in there. Yeah, if you haven't seen, home, if you yeah. haven't seen the building, do 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 take a look. Look in the ambulances. Look inside. Look at the equipment. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's it's yours. It's in your town. So yeah, might as well swing by and get a whole cup of coffee. What a coincidence! We have the most calls when you put the building right now. Town. Yeah. yeah. It, it, to be honest with you, uh, uh, when you're looking at some of the sites that we're looking, they're closer to Keene, and, and it was nothing with nothing with Keene. But we also know there's a heavy traffic flow and you get out to other sites that made it a little bit more difficult. I happened and I, well Jack actually looked at me and said, What about the strong room? Strong room building. And I grew up with the strong room. So we reached out to him and I think Polly should taught me how to swim. And so, you know, it was we were able to we were able to work out the situation. And and, 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 and not that it matters to this point. The building wasn't for sale. And we walked up to the door. He gave them an offer they couldn't refuse. Hey, you want to sell? <laughs> and they said, oh, okay. Yeah. I said, I'm not sure enough. And they said, well, let me think about it. So I thought about it. I came back with a price. I said, okay. Well, that was it. But the more we thought about it, if you need to go to Fitzroy, Troy, Harrisville, Walbrook, everything's right there. And, and, to on, and, and to be able to get on the highway to go to Sauter, even, I mean, and, and guys, tell me if it's not true, we have, we've had feedback from Sauter, we're getting there faster than anybody has in the past. And we we only know that because they're, they're telling us that. Mm -hmm. And so, it, you know, even, it's, it's a good, I think it's a great site to be at. And over time, when we are able to, if you know, substations to be closer to some of the other communities, that's something we can look at. You know, down the road, we're not here yet. But you do see in the future you're going to need more of a building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I mean, yeah. I mean, you got an ambulance outside, right? You have six well, bays and seven ambulances. Well, uh, one, one, luckily we have one, one of our ambulances up in Maplewood. Oh, yeah. But we, we built some barriers up there when we, we did the nursing. And sleeping quarters up there too. Yeah. It's amazing that one year and a half I'll put away. It's good enough. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Deputy, do you have a point for that? Uh, one thing with the training too, as far as like the CPR that we're providing with our community outreach, uh, the vast majority of our CPR classes are actually being instructed by paramedics. We, we hit on, you know, the different levels of provider and just the importance to recognize that not all even CPR classes are created equal, but to have a seasoned um, higher level care teaching that information, there's, there's a lot of benefit. Our onboarding process is now a week um, of information. You know, some of that information you saw those hot spots. We're making sure that our new uh, employees that are coming on board are aware of how to get to those locations the best way. 
you guys have these beautiful covered bridges that some of our ambulances have to avoid. I need to make sure that an individual coming from the state of Vermont or the state of Massachusetts understands that um, and isn't just following the blue line. So we, we've worked really hard to, to do that. Um, we hold you our daily, well, uh, you know, we, we hold our daily trains with our crews, uh, monthly trains, and now I'm really excited we have a, a full fidelity um, simulator where we'll be able to recreate an entire call of any sort of aspect that's built into a machine and they have to address that in a, in a safe environment. Um, so, yeah, thank you for your time. It was nice to meet you. Nice job. Just real quick, one more thing. Let's just add some background. Yeah, I didn't hear what you think the great for is here with any of them. I wouldn't mean you did. The great great work. Great work, yeah. The great work is, but where we're at with our current staff and all this, where we have that in place, but we're backing ourselves up. You know, I think the thing that back up is kind of copy that everybody wants, but we've got more ambulances 24-7 than anyone's ever had, ever. Keen and Deluzio combined. So wow. the concept of backup is relevant very often. Because we're established for what this, this county needs yeah. for ambulances. When we need it, though, we know, we pretty much know that we're the future. They come right, and they come right there. Yep. And they've done that a handful of times. Yeah. We currently have uh, 17 paramedics. But, we, you know, with five ambulances, that's, like I say, that, that's more than Delusio had at their peak. When they're at their lowest point, they only have two or three or two and a half. Gene's got two, two and a half. So, um, the, the need for backup is nowhere near what it used to be just because of, of the groove we settled into and the need we saw and the need we felt. So you on the back.
these new guys uh, making the meetings longer. Hey, I didn't ask that. No, you did not all. You did not all. Huh? You did not all. I'm straight. Yeah. So we, I think we got through pretty much everything on the agenda. I just handed out a letter for the board's consideration. We're trying to put together a uh, request for congressionally directed spending for the West Swansea Water Company project that we talked about earlier, earlier this year. The board was adamant that they wanted us to pursue all opportunities. So this is one that um, Underwood and I have pulling together at the 11th hour. But um, So I put a copy of the letter in front of you, I've talked to Chinberg Properties about a letter of support in the Greater Monadnock Chamber. So, I think we'll be able to put together an application for some, hopefully, some funding. Great. Uh, you want us to sign one of these? Or that you would be great. Somewhere? Yeah, if you could, that'd be great. If there's any questions. Any follow-up on the uh, election you want to go over? I just want to mention that we put out an RFQ last week, request for qualifications for the wastewater treatment plant study. Um, so we'll hope to get uh, submissions back in April and get someone working on that ASAP. Wastewater. going to give us a new rules of procedure to sign or is that just signing to authorize it so we don't get Motion made and seconded. Scott Walker. Karazinski. Shut us off there, young, young fella.